Amen. So let's open our Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, as we continue our series on developing godly discipline. Romans 13, we're going to be in verse 14, and then as we have been in this topical series, we'll be around to a number of other verses in the New Testament as well. Let's begin with some review. The components of godly discipline that we've identified so far, they are, they are these. There's responsibility, there's organization, there they are, hard work, self-denial, and last week we considered accountability. Actually, with the ones I've got listed there, with all of these components in place, you have what it takes to develop discipline in your life. Put those into practice, and you can have discipline in your life. But there are a couple other needful components to keep your discipline on track. And that's what I'd like us to consider both tonight and then next week, which will be my last in this series. The one that I want us to consider tonight is what separates our discipline from the world's discipline. From the beginning of this study, I have been talking about godly discipline. That was the, the title of the whole series. It's godly discipline. But tonight, I want to clarify the heart of godly discipline. And it is this. It is Christ-focused. Christ-focused. Romans chapter 13, verse 14 says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's talk about the purpose of discipline and review that purpose again. For the Christian, the purpose of discipline is godliness. The purpose of discipline is godliness. Now the world has a different idea. For the world, maybe it's success. Or for the world, they want discipline because they, it gives them a better life or to feel better about yourself. And those things may happen to you when you get a disciplined life, but, but that's not the ultimate purpose, not for the Christian. Our goal as believers is godliness. First Peter, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Paul says this, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and listen to this, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise, and, and we all know that bodily exercise requires discipline, right? You, you can't exercise without discipline. That's part of it. Bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So our goal is godliness because that's the most important. Turn over to first, no, excuse me, second Peter, second Peter chapter one, please. Second Peter chapter one. I believe I referenced this before as well, but I want us to consider it again. Verses five to seven. Second Peter 1, beginning with verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Now notice what he says. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity or love. Now these three verses are some of the most succinct and significant verses in the New Testament on spiritual growth. Peter explains to us here, in a nutshell, how to grow in what he says in chapter 3, verse 18, the last verse of the book, how to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he describes these things almost as if they're building blocks. So after you're saved, there's faith, the foundation. 
add to your faith. What's the first thing? He says, you put there virtue. And then, then on top of virtue, you add knowledge. And then on top of knowledge, you add self-control. And then you give endurance, and then you come to godliness. Finally, as he mentions in the last verse, you add brotherly love and then agape love or sacrificial love. There's an order to those words. There's an order to that growth, that progression that's there. There's a goal also. We are to be growing towards godliness and love. Do you see it there? You're adding this to your faith, and then you're adding this, and you're adding this, and ultimately you're going to be getting to godliness. You'll be adding that, and then you're going to be adding these two types of love, one higher than the other. So we are growing towards godliness and love. And the mortar for all these stones, if I can call them that, these stones is discipline. In verse 5, he says, giving all diligence giving all diligence. It's going to take discipline to grow in these areas of your life. And so he says, you've got to engage the discipline to get there. So discipline is meant to push us towards godliness. This is the goal. Now, why does God intend for discipline to push us towards godliness? Well, very simply, it's because that that's God's goal for our lives. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, Paul puts it this way. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you see what the purpose is there? God's plan for you is to be conformed to the image of his Son. John writes it this way in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are among the children of God. Now we are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, take a look around at all of us here we are children of God, but, but we're not in our final form yet. Okay? We're not quite there. But we know that when he shall appear, that would be Christ, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So he tells you what the goal is. He tells you the time frame, too. When Jesus Christ comes back, then... We shall be changed, as Paul says, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. We shall be like him, Christ-like. Christ-likeness is manifested in our lives most clearly, folks, through godliness and love. Think about it. When do you look most like Jesus Christ? When you're living a godly life and when you're loving like Jesus loved. And it's discipline that enables us to achieve it. There's the purpose of discipline. So let's come back then to this component of Christ-focused. And that's where we learn about the problem of worldly discipline. Worldly discipline. Yes, the world has discipline. Do a Google search for a discipline on your phone or your computer. Not now, you can do it afterwards. Do a Google search for discipline or self-discipline and you will find a lot of instruction out there on how to develop discipline in your life. You can watch YouTube videos on how to develop discipline in your life. And you want to know something? They're going to mention some of the components that I've already shared with you. But I'm going to warn you, what you'll find there is worldly discipline and it's dangerous. Let me give you three reasons why it's dangerous. Number one, the Lord is left out. The Lord is left out. Look over in the book of James, please. James chapter 4. Beginning with verse 13. James 4, 13. James says, Go to now, ye that say, 
Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is evil. I mentioned to you that the second component of godly discipline is organization or planning. Right? Even the secular world understands that planning is necessary. James notes that here. He talks about the people who are planning to go into a certain city, to buy, to sell, and to make a certain profit. They've got it all figured out. They're planning. But James actually points out the problem here. Listen, folks, the problem is not planning. The problem is not planning. The problem is planning apart from God's will. That's the problem. Leaving the Lord out of the plans. That's a big mistake. Folks, we are mere mortals whose lives pass as quickly as a vapor breath in the winter air. That's what James says. You are like a, your life is like a vapor. And you know what those Pennsylvania winter days are like, and you breathe out, and there it is, and it's gone. In the whole scheme of things, that's what your life is, and that's what mine is. Even if you live to be 100, that's all it is. It is nothing but proud audacity that would go and make all your plans for what you're going to do next week, next month, next year, next decade without considering the Lord. Because you don't even know what tomorrow holds. Or as Jesus says, you can't add one, one inch to your stature you can't add one day to your life. Our days are numbered. It's pure boasting to say that you can do all of that without thinking about God. Jesus gave us the example of the successful farmer. That's not what it's called in the Bible, but that's what I'm going to call it tonight. The successful farmer. Do you remember him? He, he went out, he planted his field, and then he got a bumper crop. So he decided he was going to tear down his barns and build bigger barns so that he could store his bumper crop and then take it easy for the rest of his life. But God said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then, whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? He had done a lot of planning but he had left the Lord out of the picture. Worldly discipline leaves the Lord out of its plans, and in the end, it will be just as futile as the farmer who died unexpectedly. When you're setting your goals, when you're making your plans, folks, when you're determining even what matters of self-denial you need to instill in your life, you can't leave God out. You can't leave God out. So these are things that need to be done prayerfully. These are things that need to be decided according to the wisdom of the Bible. You need this wisdom to determine what your plans are, what your discipline should be in life. The first problem with worldly discipline is it leaves the Lord out. Secondly, the flesh is exalted. The flesh is exalted. The fourth component of godly discipline is, is self-denial. We talked about that. No discipline, hear me, no discipline can be achieved without self-denial. You will have to say no to your flesh, to yourself. But if you pursue worldly discipline, you will not put the flesh to death. You will exalt the flesh. Let me show you how. In my studies, I stumbled across this article. How to practice self-denial and what you'll gain by doing so. How to practice self-denial and what you'll gain by doing so. Sounds like a pretty good title, doesn't it? 
The problem is it's not Christ-focused. The writer begins this way. Sometimes I don't eat when I'm hungry. Sometimes I take painfully cold showers in the winter. Sometimes I steadfastly refuse to scratch an itch. Sometimes I deny, deliberately deny myself things that are good for me. You should too. And then the writer goes on to, to list a whole bunch of recommendations for you and for me of things that we ought to deny ourselves, such as this. Skip dessert when everyone else at the table is having it. Eat the leftovers or order the meal that sounds the least appetizing. Don't season your food at all for a day. No salt, no pepper, no garlic, nothing. Well, here's one for you. Sleep on the floor instead of your bed. Take only your blanket, no pillow or extra padding. Skip your daily coffee. Well, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> when a package arrives in the mail, set it aside and open it tomorrow instead of right away. Would you believe that the author actually has a theological premise for these suggestions, these matters of self-denial? According to the author, self-denial, quote, brings us closer to the eternal. Is it true? Turn over to Colossians chapter 2. We'll find Paul's answer to that idea. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 20. He says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances or rules? Then he names a few. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Now what you find in these verses is that Paul condemns what we call sometimes asceticism. That's the, the rigorous practice of self-denial and self-mortification. Now listen, he didn't condemn self-denial and self-mortification because Christians shouldn't practice those things. In fact, in the very next chapter in Colossians, he is going to encourage us to practice mortification. He says, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And then he names those sinful things that we shouldn't be doing. But he condemned the idea that self-denial by itself makes us spiritual. It brings us closer to God. He says it can't. It does not have the power to do that. Listen, folks, only Jesus Christ can change our lives. Only Jesus can save our souls, and only Jesus can make us spiritual. But many people falsely think that rules and regulations these worldly rules and regulations will make them spiritual. Rules like don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. They appear to be wise. They appear to be spiritual. The, the word in verse 23 is their will worship. Indeed, they have a show of wisdom, and they have a, a show of, of will worship. Will worship is the self-imposed worship or religious zeal. It's like a self-imposed worship. They appear to be wise. They appear to be spiritual. They appear to be humble, like a monk who wears some kind of rough burlap uh, for his clothing and does uh, long prayers and sleeps on a hard mattress or maybe on a wooden crate. 
uh, and punishes his body as it were and walks around appearing to be humble. But listen, folks, it's not true. It's not true wisdom. It's not true spirituality. And it's not true humility. Look at what Paul says in the last phrase there in verse 23. Not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. The word honor there has the idea of value. No value to satisfy the desires of the flesh. Or just very simply put, no value to put, to put the flesh to death. They can't do it. Instead, what happens? When you focus on the self-denial that you're just going to follow all these rules, your flesh is actually exalted in the end. Turn back a few pages to Philippians uh, chapter 3. And you find the way Paul describes it. Paul describes in Philippians chapter 3 his life before he was saved and then his life after he was saved. And it's very significant for us here. Philippians 3, beginning with verse 3. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now listen to his testimony. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he describes the way he was before he was saved. He wasn't trusting Jesus Christ for his uh, salvation. He was trusting in his own good works. He says, it was, I was trying to follow the law. I was trying to be righteous. When it comes to the law, I was a Pharisee. That's the, the most righteous of all of them. So is his attitude. But when you look at that list, talk about discipline. Do you see it there? It took discipline to be a Pharisee, folks. You can't say that those guys were undisciplined. Praying certain days of the week, fasting certain days, and knowing what days you were supposed to do what on what. Most of us would probably never even remember what we were doing, and so we'd be lost on it. They were disciplined. They were rigid. Did it put the flesh to death? No. It strengthened the flesh. You hear what he says? I have confidence in the flesh. And so, folks, self-denial must be Christ-focused. Paul emphasizes that again here in, in Philippians 3. He emphasizes it in Colossians 2, and again in chapter 3. He says, there we read it in chapter 2 in Colossians, you are dead with Christ. He goes on in chapter 3, and he says, you are risen with Christ. He says, set your affection on things above, where Christ is seated. He says, after all, Christ is your life. You see, it's all focused on Jesus Christ now that we're saved. And so our discipline must be Christ-focused too. Our self-denial must be Christ-focused. Or we will just simply exalt the flesh and not Jesus Christ. Well, so you might ask the question, is there any benefit then in the practice of, of something like fasting? Right? We talk about fasting. Pastor Wendell's encouraged us to take the first uh, Wednesday of the month, that would be today, and to fast. Or if you couldn't do it today, then, then pick another day to fast for our, our church, our nation. And the answer to that is yes, there is benefit in fasting. The Old Testament and the New Testament both commend fasting to us. But listen to what Jesus said to the Pharisees when they asked him why his disciples did not fast. Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, verse 15. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then they shall fast. And you want to know something, folks? The book of Acts reveals the truth of that statement. 
The early church fasted before sending Paul and Barnabas out on their first missionary journey. They fasted when they ordained elders or pastors. Paul commends fasting in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 when he talks to married couples and said that he himself often fasted in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But listen, folks, their fasting was not strictly for the purpose of afflicting their souls. It was to seek God in prayer. It was to seek the will of God through prayer. It was because of a heavy spiritual burden or something that was on their heart. And you want to know something else? Fasting is never commanded in the New Testament. It is commended as something that we should do, as a good thing to do, something we should consider, but never are we commanded as Christians to fast. And that's why Pastor says so often when he talks about it is, it's your decision, I'm not telling you to do it. Any church that tells you that you have to fast is out of line. When Jesus was with his disciples, they did not fast because he was with them. The bridegroom was there. The celebration was there. And what were they? They were focused on Jesus and his presence. But when he went back to heaven, he said that they would fast, and we read that they did. Why? So that they could focus on Christ better. Isn't that what the purpose of fasting is? To bring our heart in line again and focus better on Jesus Christ. This is fasting with the right focus, and therefore it's acceptable with God. So beware of worldly discipline, because they leave the Lord out, because they talk about denying the flesh, but in reality they build the flesh up. It's exalted. And here's the third thing. Faith is ignored. In worldly discipline, faith is ignored. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do you hear what the scripture says? Without faith you cannot please God. You may have all the discipline in the world, a life of perfect order and complete self-denial. But if your discipline has no faith, if it is not motivated by faith in God, it is not going to please God, no matter how good you may appear on the outside. Romans 14, 23. He that, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. Listen, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We are to walk in faith. We are to live by faith in everything we do. But the world leaves faith out of this equation of self-discipline. And therefore, they, they do not have godly discipline. Listen, folks, if you leave God out of your discipline, if you have fleshly self-denial, if your discipline is not motivated by faith, you may still achieve discipline in your life, worldly discipline, but you won't have godly discipline. And without godly discipline, you will never achieve godliness. And therefore, you miss out on God's ultimate goal for your life. That's why godly discipline is so important for us. So let's very uh, quickly, in the end, talk about the right focus in discipline. The right focus. So you're in Philippians chapter 3. Look at verses 7 and 8, because here's Paul again. He says, after listing all those things, that disciplined life that he had before he was saved, he says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. As I said, Paul was disciplined before he was saved. I mean, he was a Pharisee. And the Pharisees were disciplined, religiously disciplined people. But then Paul realized that his good works couldn't save him, and he needed Jesus. And so he counted everything lost for the sake of Christ. 
But you know something? You read Paul's life in the book of Acts. You read what he, his testimony throughout his epistles. Paul didn't go from living a disciplined life before he was saved to an undisciplined life after he was He was an extremely disciplined man as a believer in Jesus Christ. The discipline didn't change. What changed? His focus. His focus. Now he's focused on Christ. Look at verse 9. So I want to win Christ, he says, and be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's what he lived for. He lived for Jesus Christ. He lived to emulate Jesus Christ. In, in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he says to the Corinthians there, he says, Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. He lived every day consciously trying to follow the Lord Jesus Christ so that he even said to his, his uh, churches as he taught to them, he says, follow, do what I do. As I'm following Christ, you do what I do. Can you say that to people who are watching you? You can if your focus is Jesus Christ and your discipline is focused on Christ. In Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he gives this testimony, an amazing testimony. He says, but none of these things move me. He's talking about the suffering that might come to him in Jerusalem. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's his focus. Folks, discipline is not an end in itself. That's the worldly view. For the Christian, discipline is a means to an end. What is that end? It's a life that knows Christ, walks with Christ, and pleases Christ in every way. We call that godliness. That's what we're striving for. That's the right focus. So what does this mean for us practically, for each of us? Let me just suggest a few things. We can make it practical here. Number one, remember the goal is Christ-likeness. When you're planning your, your discipline, when you're working at discipline in your life, remember the goal is Christ-likeness. That's where you're at. That's the aim that you have. Number two, pursue discipline in matters of eternal significance. Pursue discipline in matters of eternal significance. I'm talking about things like Bible reading. That's an eternal thing. Church attendance, prayer, family relationships, business integrity. You don't need to worry about pursuing discipline uh, to be the best gamer in the world. Some teenagers have the idea. You don't need to pursue discipline in accumulating all of your toys or having the, the most immaculate looking yard on the whole street. Think about the eternal. If you're going to pursue discipline, Pursue it in the matters of the eternal. Number three, establish godly priorities. I'm talking about the things that God would say are important. <laughs> what would he say? And that goes right along with number two. Number four, practice self-denial in areas that directly promote godliness. Okay? I doubt it. I doubt that it will help you to take a cold shower every day unless that's the only way for you to wake up in the morning and read your Bible, okay? But, but why, why pursue that kind of self-denial if it's not going to promote godliness? I doubt that skipping dessert at the family birthday party is going to make you any more like Christ. So enjoy your cake. 
But listen, folks. Making yourself wake up 30 minutes earlier so that you have time for prayer, that will promote godliness. Disciplining your tongue to speak only words of kindness to people, that will promote godliness. Giving up your Sunday ball team so that you can be in church on Sunday evening, that will promote godliness. You see, there is a place for self-denial in our lives, and the reality is that we don't practice it enough. But let's practice it where it's going to promote godliness in our lives, and it's going to make us more like Jesus. Last of all, number five, work hard at your discipline. I've already told you it's going to take hard work. But rely on the power through Jesus Christ. Philippians 4.13 says, Paul himself says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You, you will have to work hard at discipline. But Jesus offers his power to come alongside and enable you. So take advantage of that and don't try to do it in your own strength. That is Christ-focused discipline. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for the word of God, the challenge that it is. Help us, Father, to understand we live in a world in which there are so many undisciplined people that we are now starting to see a backlash to, to other people in the world who are trying to promote discipline. But the discipline they promote is almost as bad as the undisciplined living because they've left you out of the picture. And many of them, therefore, are fooled either through their false religions or their own selfish works that they're all right with God because their life is disciplined. It's not true, Lord. We know it in the scriptures. We see it. Paul himself told us from his own testimony. And so I pray, Lord, that we would lay all that aside, that worldly thinking, and that we would pursue godly thinking, your thinking on these matters. Yes, Lord, we do need discipline in our lives. Help us to pursue godly discipline. And I pray that as a result, you would do a great work in our lives and we would see more Christ-likeness every day from each of us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.